Disabuse the folks of the notion that uh, CUFP is a conference for people who just care about Haskell by uh, doing a couple of talks about Haskell. Um, so um, the first one will be Adam Gundry talking about Haskell in the enterprise. Not in the enterprise. <laughs> Thanks in, very in, much. In the small. <laughs> Haskell, in, yes. It, I'm not sure whether this qualifies as enterprise in the sense of uh, 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 the, the previous keynote, but it's certainly Haskell uh, in, in what you might call the real world as opposed to uh, uh, academia, although I am, I'm from an academic background, so apologies if this seems, seems a little bit like an academic uh, kind of talk. Can you hear me at the back okay? Yeah. And uh, great. And, uh, and I should say, please do uh, interrupt me with uh, questions uh, as I go along if you, if you have any. Uh, it's uh, uh, much better to get to the end of the talk, I find, if someone uh, has uh, interrupted me along the way. Um, so a little bit about well types, first of all, in case you haven't heard of us. Um, we are uh, a Haskell development and consultancy company. We're completely uh, distributed, working sort of with uh, individuals uh, scattered over Western Europe and the US. Um, and I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, one of our client projects and how some of the ideas coming from Haskell can uh, help out with a the problem they faced. So a little bit about the, uh, uh, the context of the problem we uh, uh, were presented with by our clients. Uh, the uh, clients developing a, a video sharing platform for teachers who want to be able to record lessons they give and then have other teachers give them feedback to help their professional development. Um, and there's, there's a lot to the system, but the, uh, the bit that we can come in to uh, deal with is the uh, essentially the database. It's, it's actually uh, implemented as an in-memory database in Haskell, but that's, that's sort of not too critical to the point here, but uh, um, the idea is that uh, there's uh, a, the data model at the center of this big system, which is going to be changing fairly rapidly and is going to be having to talk to a bunch of different systems written in a mixture of languages. So there's some Haskell, there's Ruby, Objective-C, JavaScript, uh, uh, across sort of the iPad apps and the, uh, the web apps and other components of this system. And it's, uh, it's a real system, it's in production. And I don't actually have up-to-date numbers from the client on how many people are using it, but uh, uh, it's uh, in on the order of thousands of schools across the world, in, uh, primarily in the EU with, with some uh, use in the US and Australia. And uh, I don't expect you to take anything in from what this slide means, and I don't really know most of what this slide means, but just to give you uh, an idea of what's going on, we've got some uh, chunk of Haskell uh, in blue here, uh, talking to lots of these other systems, some of which are written in different languages, some of which are talking directly to users or uh, the support teams in the client. Uh, and so all these different pieces are evolving at a fairly rapid rate as the uh, client develops their systems fairly quickly to try and uh, get to the, uh, uh, the stage they want to be with their software. Uh, and somehow we need to, in the, the Haskell data uh, end of the system, just keep up. The, uh, the data that the client wants to store is going to be changing fairly rapidly as they figure out what it is that uh, their system needs to keep track of. And we need to uh, be able to have a reliable system for storing the data, for responding to queries from these various other components. Uh, so how do we keep on top of all this complexity and all this change? Well, I'm a Haskell programmer. I like types. I like to be able to write down what it is that I'm talking about so that I can understand what it is I'm talking about. I, uh, uh, I want to be able to write down what the representation of users in my database is going to be uh, in such a way that I can program with it and know that I'm preserving the data invariants. But then, OK, I've got my nice typed program. What happens when I suddenly decide that I need to store a little bit more data? alongside my user record. And, and now the types have changed. And OK, I can recompile my program, and I can fix the type errors. And it's really, really easy to refactor, which is something that Haskell excels at. But now the data that I saved using yesterday's version of the application won't load in today's version of the application, because the types are different, and the serialization format doesn't match up. So how can I solve this problem of uh, rapidly changing the data model, but at the same time, uh, keeping the, the data in sync with it. So that's the, the kind of problem we're trying to tackle. 
And I'm going to try and show how some ideas from Haskell, although I won't be showing any Haskell code, uh, can help uh, uh, tackle that. So uh, the idea for uh, how we're going to solve this is start off with uh, a domain-specific language for describing the schema of the data involved. So this is like taking Haskell's type system and just working out what's the minimum from it that we can get away with uh, to describe our data model. Uh, it's, so it's a fairly simple domain-specific language for talking about types. We can have uh, so some fixed universe of basic types, uh, records, unions, enumerations. Uh, and then, so from that, we're going to generate the actual Haskell data types that mean that when we're writing Haskell code, uh, we know that we're uh, working uh, with types which conform to this schema. But also, uh, we can do things like uh, generating code to uh, serialize and deserialize, to uh, generate documentation so that programmers working in Ruby or in other parts of the system can understand what's, what what to expect from our web service. So far, so good. We've got the types. But then we also need some notion of what's happening when these types change. So uh, the idea is that we'll have another d domain specific language, this time for change, change logs, that uh, describes uh, what's, what I have to do to get from yesterday's data model to today's data model. Crucially, that's both human and machine readable. So uh, it looks just like a change log that you might see in uh, uh, an application and tells the programmers in the system what to expect uh, that's different from uh, what they've seen before. But it also tells uh, the machine what the changes are. So that means that in particular, we can automatically uh, check it in continuous integration so that we know that as the developers are changing the data model They're also correctly updating the change log uh, and it means that we can uh, Automatically migrate the data in the application so that at any time we know that we can roll forward to the new version uh, And the system will just take care of uh, adapting the, uh, the data that we've got stored So let's have a look at a bit of an example to make this a bit more concrete uh, you can see on the left here we've got the, uh, the schema. I'm not going to explain the details of this language, but I'm hoping it's uh, fairly evident to simplify it slightly for the presentation. But uh, we've got users which store a record of a username and some Boolean flag saying whether or not they're an administrator. Uh, usernames are just uh, uh, another way of talking about strings with some type safety so that we don't actually mix up usernames with any other string in our application. And this is just the, uh, the version at the beginning of the application, if you like. We've got uh, no changelog information, and we can represent data in this, this schema. Then, so maybe we decide that we want to uh, count the number of times the user's logged in, uh, and decide we need to add some, uh, an extra field and an extra type to our schema. Uh, so I've added this uh, logins field of type login count, and login count is just a new uh, basic type. But now, of course, the, the change log on the right doesn't quite tell us enough to get from version 0.1 data to this version, so uh, we extend the change log in parallel, uh, saying that in version 0.2, I've, uh, reading from bottom to top, added uh, this new type login count and then uh, added a field that makes use of it. Okay, and then Say we decide, actually, we don't need this Boolean flag admin, just make that uh, disappear. Uh, similarly, I can extend the change log again to uh, describe another version this time with uh, recording the fact that the field's been removed. OK, so far, anyone, everyone hopefully clear? Any questions about what I presented? Yeah. Right, so all I'm presenting here is the, uh, the sort of the schema describing the types and then the change log. So that I'm saying that the default value is zero so that I know when I have a value, uh, I should fill it in with that default. Does that answer your question? So crucially, 
Yeah, so the question is, is this, is this uh, generated automatically, I think? And the answer in a lot of systems is yes, that you would generate the change log from the data model. And here the answer is no, not directly. Rather, I'm, as a developer, I'm writing this change log. So the point of that is that I can, I've got a language for expressing the, what the changes were and the order in which they happened, uh, which means that I can, I can have changes that are a bit more complex than you could do if, if you were automatically uh, discovering what the changes were. Uh, I'll, I'll, the, the question of sort of automatically writing this, I'll come back to in a little bit, but uh, that's the idea. Okay. So what does this buy us now that we've got this change log language? Well, first of all, we can automatically validate that uh, the changes we're making uh, make some kind of sense. That uh, when I say I'm adding a new field, the type of that field is something which uh, refers to uh, types that I've already introduced, for example. So are, are all the changes we're making meaningful? Also, um, we can verify that given an old version, the change log is in fact complete, that it, it describes how to get to the, the latest version of the system. Um, and so we know that when we come to migrate data that, that we've got a chance of doing so correctly. So that can happen either uh, uh, sort of uh, as a pre-commit hook, if you like, or uh, during continuous integration. And as I've mentioned before, this also gets us uh, migration, the ability to, given data in the old format, just uh, have the system automatically uh, convert it into the new format. Uh, so we can, we, we can run that in automated deployment and, and reduce the risk that, that when we deploy a new version of the server, we, uh, uh, we end up in a situation where uh, we can't uh, read the data from the uh, database and uh, um, can't go forward. And of course, we're testing that that, uh, uh, that works automatically as well. So what the validation looks like is, uh, so here's a typical example of what might happen if uh, I forget to write the latest version after removing the admin field. Uh, so the system is going to tell me that uh, the, uh, the, the, the schema as it's expecting from the change log doesn't match the schema that I've written down. Uh, as a happy accident, uh, the t it turns out that the error messages we, we implemented without thinking about this happen to correspond quite nicely to the things you might additionally have to write down. Uh, I wish I could say that we'd uh, done this deliberately, but uh, uh, it was more of a, a sort of discovery we made partway through uh, developing the system, which we then, we, we, we then built on. Uh, it turns out that you can have most of the time the system automatically tell you what the changes are because you're doing it as you're going along. So the, the changes are relatively small and comprehensible. And uh, so the user can then take this output and, and feed it into the, the written change log. Uh, but because they're explicitly writing the change log, they can also modify it or change, so change how it's presented. Or uh, sometimes the system won't be able to guess that you've made a fairly large refactoring to your data types. Uh, so it won't know automatically how you can get from one place to the other. But you can, uh, you can write that down. And, uh, um, maybe there's a lesson here that sort of when, when designing your domain specific language, uh, uh, think about the errors it generates and how they relate to what uh, the, uh, the user is uh, writing in the, the input. Uh, I wish we'd thought about it slightly earlier. We might have got it working uh, more reliably than it does. But, uh. Okay, so how does the migration actually work? Uh, so something I, I haven't been talking very much about exactly how things are represented in the system, uh, but uh, we've got some data set within the application. We're going to export that in some generic format, which is not specific to the particular serialization strategy being used uh, for the, the Haskell data type. So we're currently using JSON uh, simply because it's a nice, convenient format that's easy to read when uh, uh, thinking about these migrations. Um, so we're going to export a version of the data set containing uh, the version number and the data schema that was uh, used for that version of the application. And then we can install our new version of the application, uh, which hopefully has got a change log which records the, the old application's version number. Uh, so that allows us to locate 
the version and find out what the changes have been since the old version to the new version so we can apply those in parallel both to the schema and to the data uh, and hopefully end up with a schema which corresponds to what the new version of the application is expecting. Uh, and in general that should be the case and so we can just uh, uh, translate back from the generic representation, of, in this case JSON, to the uh, representation that the, the new version of the application is expecting. So we can just uh, restart our server. One thing to note is that the, in this setup the migration is being performed offline. So we're shutting down the server, uh, doing the data migration and then restarting the server. Uh, in the, uh, uh, the particular case of uh, this, this client's application, sort of a few minutes uh, uh, downtime overnight is not a problem they're concerned about. I realize in other settings that might be more problematic, but it works out okay here. So just to give an example of what that looks like, um, now we're talking about real data rather than just the, uh, uh, the schema. So on the right I've got that old change log, and here uh, a little bit of data in version 0.1 uh, of the scheme at the bottom. So remember we had this, the uh, username uh, and admin fields. And so uh, if I come to uh, install an app, the, the version of the application using version 0.3 of the schema, uh, the, the system can automatically, uh, from the change log, it doesn't have to do anything to add a lo the login count type, but when the user record changes, uh, we can locate all the occurrences of that type in the schema uh, and add the logins field. So uh, we can migrate through to version 0.2 of the schema and then similarly uh, to get to version 0.3 uh, delete the admin field. So hopefully that's, that's all sort of fairly straightforward. Uh, the, the choice of JSON here isn't, as a generic representation isn't, isn't crucial but, uh, and in fact we're looking at switching, switching that but I'll get onto that. Uh, but then what happens if uh, the, the language of migrations we're given doesn't quite capture everything? So we, we've seen things like adding and removing fields, but sometimes I'm going to want to do more complex changes uh, to my schema which aren't uh, already listed. Uh, so we, we have the ability to run arbitrary Haskell code uh, that manipulates uh, adjacent objects in order to make changes that uh, otherwise wouldn't be possible. And so that might be, uh, I'm, I'm changing lots of types in my uh, schema, so I just need to run a migration over the entire data set. Uh, or it might be that I'm going to change one particular field, and so I'd like to write the Haskell code that modifies that field and have it automatically work over uh, all the occurrences of that field anywhere in the, the data set. So how does this actually work in practice? Well, it's been uh, easy to keep up with a very rapidly uh, changing uh, schema, and we can, we can in general catch errors uh, uh, thanks to the ability to validate that the schema does in fact describe uh, what it should do. Uh, and as I mentioned, the ability to copy and paste from an error message into the change log is a real benefit to, to writing these things quickly. Uh, the ability to write down these things in a typed way and, uh, and have a reasonable amount of confidence that if we make changes to the types we're going to uh, be able to keep up means that we actually can refactor the schema as we discover that uh, it doesn't quite capture what we want. Um, and so we've been through 250 different versions of our data model and somehow we're uh, managing to keep up. On the other hand, there are some uh, downsides in particular, the fact that the change log is necessarily linear uh, means that if you've got two developers working on different sets of changes to the data model, at some point you've just got to sit down and resolve that conflict and, uh, uh, and decide how those two sets of changes fit together. Maybe it's useful that that's made explicit, but it does produce a point of uh, merge conflict. And uh, um, as I mentioned, sort of there are uh, questions about whether you want an approach like this if uh, you can't afford any downtime. So where we're going uh, with this approach, um, one particular optimization to reduce the, the amount of time required is just to switch to a generic format uh, uh, which, for which we're using CBOR. Um, and then we, 
we're looking to add the ability to migrate bidirectionally. So you might want to not only upgrade your application, but downgrade it and have the data revert to the correct format there, which needs a little bit more to be expressed in the schema. Uh, and just working with, with JSON is all well and good, but it doesn't really capture the types that are involved. And so uh, we're looking to capture that in a slightly more type safe way. But I'll stop there and uh, very happy to take questions. Yeah, so the question is, so are we versioning the, the API as well as the, the data schema? Yeah, that's something I've not really talked about very much. But the, so the schema that, I've, that we're writing down contains the types that are used in the, the data model. But are also, those are also the types that are used for communicating with, uh, with clients. Uh, so, so yes, the change log sort of, in addition to describing what's changing in the data, also describes what's changing in the way the, uh, the clients should communicate with us. Uh, of course, there's, we've got to be a bit more restrictive in the changes we make because it's going to take time for those changes to be propagated and uh, we, we might need to be compatible with multiple versions of the API for clients and we don't have a very good way of capturing that yet. But that's the idea. Uh, okay, so you got this uh, language for your data model and you describe your change logs and because you have like this nice, concise, sort of restricted way of describing it, you can do validation. And then, you know, you can also throw in arbitrary Haskell code and that sort of like stops working. So I'm sort of curious as to like how often that Haskell code that you've injected into change logs has bitten you, like in practice. Uh, in practice, not very frequently, primarily because we don't, we don't really very often have to, right. have to do it. Um, because so the language is expressive enough that we usually by composing uh, simpler changes you can you can avoid the need for it. Um, so we, what we can do, of course, is verify that uh, uh, we the changes that the Haskell code have made are type correct. So we can sort of dynamically check that. Okay. So can um, you give, maybe it would help if you gave an example of like what you use that re release valve for release valve for then. Like what's a, what's an example where you've had to drop down into Haskell. Um, I'm trying to think of the, a, a good example. So something like maybe switching from a representation of something as a string to an enumeration. So where previously you were just letting the client sort of put, put anything they liked into a field. Now you're deciding we want to nail down the particular values. So then at the moment you need to to have a Haskell um, migra piece of code that decides how to map from the, the whatever the client's given you to the fixed enumeration you're allowing. And you need some way of deciding what to do if, uh, if okay. cool. they've given you something. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much.